everybody welcome back to another episode of this week in finance a podcast by financial friends i am your host brendan and this is the podcast where i take everything that is noteworthy that has happened this past week in finance and i talk about it give you my thoughts opinions feelings emotions etc and really just tell you what's going on this week in finance. I think I provide a unique perspective compared to a news anchor or someone else out there. Obviously, I'm young. I have a a fresh view of this world, and I'm going to give you all of my thoughts and opinions. But before we hop into it this week, I do want to go ahead and thank the sponsor of This Week in Finance, Zencaster. Zencaster is an absolutely fantastic tool um, that allows you to record podcasts with absolute ease ease, but we are going to talk about that a little bit later in the show, so go ahead and stick around for that. Let's address the elephant in the room, Russia. Russia has invaded Ukraine. Um, this is not something that anybody wants to see. I'm going to first go ahead and give you know um, my thoughts and prayers to any Ukraine citizen or really anyone who is in harm's way because of this. Um, this is not something that any human should want to see. Um, War is never anything that is good for humanity as a whole, um, and I really don't want to see anybody get harmed. So my thoughts and prayers to anybody who is in harm's way um, tonight and through really the rest of, you know, this whole entire ordeal. Let's hope that at some point we can find a solution to whatever problems are out there and move forward, um, you know, with minimal, minimal casualties. Um, Again, my thoughts and prayers to everybody. But discussing this from a financial perspective... Markets did not like this in the morning, really didn't like it. Um, You could see here, this is the the span of the week starting on the 17th, and here we are the 23rd. 23rd, pretty steep decline, Um, and this news just happened this morning, and boom, that sudden drop right after open, um, down. Stock market down big, and somehow, and I, I really don't know how, I do know that this just tells me there is still dry powder out there in the market, Um, climbing back up from being down nearly 3% to finishing the day just about up 2%. Um, S&P up 1.5% on the day, Dow up just 0.28%, and the NASDAQ up 3.34%. Here is just the single day chart, obviously starting at this very, very um, steep low of 4,100 points and climbing all the way back up to this uh, almost 4,300, sorry, um, point mark, which is is impressive. Um, how is this going to continue to affect investments, the stock market, etc.? We did see a huge spike in cybersecurity stocks today. That was really just because you know what President Biden was talking about in terms of um, either Russian hacking over to our side of things or us trying to hack their type of things and just mess things up for them. Um, obviously, the United States heavily sanctioning Russia. I'm not sure how this is going to play a you know a role in inflation and prices. I know that you know, President Biden has made statements saying that this is the price that we do have to pay for safety and for helping defend allies. So we will see how everything unfolds in the coming weeks. This is really going to be a week by week update. Obviously, it had been going on in the news over the past week, and so we're really short on stories. Um, a lot of media coverage was taken up by this, and rightfully so. So we will continue to keep an eye on it. I will personally continue to keep an eye on it um, and what my thoughts and opinions are. Um, but that is really going to to be you know the long and the short of it. We're not really sure what's going to be going on. We're not sure what's going to continue to happen. So we are going to keep our eye on that. Next up here, we do have Ford. Ford has kind of announced, not truly announced, but um, their CEO, Jim Farley, has talked about spinning off their EV business into a new company. Do I think that this is a good idea? I don't know. Um, Obviously, General Motors, it talks about here, a spinoff of any operation would be in sharp contrast to what US-based rival General Motors has done. General Motors decided against doing that. They decided to not spin off the business for whatever reason. I think that potentially what could be going on behind the scenes, obviously I have absolutely no clue, um, is that there's some type of hiccup, whether that's with accounting, the supply chain, um, the strategy behind pushing vehicles. There's some reason why the business is being talked about being spun off or why the leader of the company would want to spin that aspect of the business off. Maybe he's not comfortable with it. Maybe he's 
very comfortable with it and he doesn't want to run you know that side of or the combustible engine um, side of things I'm not entirely sure but I do know that there is some reason as to why that's happening my guess um, is that they're gonna continue to keep this business intact in my personal opinion it makes sense to keep it intact moving forward if we think about the way that um, gas vehicles are going to kind of phase out and EVs will phase in. It almost seems like this might be a preemptive move, something that probably should not get done quite yet um, and should be more of a wait and see approach. If you think of market share, let's just say of Ford's vehicles and the way they sell them. For example, if 90% of the vehicles they sell right now are gas powered vehicles and 10% are electric vehicles, that is a very small subset of the vehicles that they're selling. So continue to stay focused on developing those vehicles, but your strategy is really still around gas vehicles and then the future of those EVs. But at some point, EVs are going to dominate that 100% and it's going to become at least 51% electric vehicles and at least 49% gas powered vehicles. And at that point, you can continue to push the electric vehicle narrative um, and develop those cars instead of developing the gas power or the, yeah, the gas power cars. Um, so does it make sense right now to spin the business off? Maybe to focus more on growth? I think, yeah, they're, you know, it, it probably could. However, long run, you're really just going to create two businesses and one of them is going to fail. And at this point in time, we would assume that the gas powered business would fail. That's what's going to make sense to fail, at least at this point in this stage in the game. Um, and when you see massive companies like General Motors deciding against doing that, there's, uh, there's a reason for it. And I'm not quite sure what that reason is, but I'm going to go ahead and trust. I put that in air quotes for anyone who is not watching on YouTube. Um, I'm going to go ahead and trust them. And obviously Ford is doing that at this point, as they do mention that they have came out and since said they have no plans of spinning off the vehicle or of spinning off the electric vehicle business or spinning off the combustible engine business. So it was going to stay intact for now. We will keep an eye on this. Ford has been in the conversations here on This Week in Finance as of late, especially as a competitor in this electric vehicle space. So uh, mark my words, Ford will probably be back next week or at least sometime soon. Next up here on the list is Amazon and the grocery business. Now, I'm not necessarily focusing directly on Amazon um, in this specific case. However, it is a very interesting to pull this chart here. And if you are listening on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google, wherever it might be, think about coming over here to YouTube. You can go ahead and listen to me on YouTube. You could see these things on the screen as I'm talking about them. But we have the top U.S. grocers by share of dollars spent. Okay, so Walmart is absolutely dominating that industry with 18%, Kroger 8.8%, Costco 6.4%. But you could see that, you know, there are still Amazon and Whole Foods sitting in, in that 1.3%. I'm not necessarily sure where these businesses can continue to go over time. And the reason I say that is, in my personal opinion, grocery business as a whole is something that is going to stay pretty stagnant over the long run. If you think about it, while yes, you could, you know, have your groceries delivered now and there's kind of this whole new wave of you sit in your house and someone brings it to you, you ultimately don't get the experience of going to shop and picking out those items yourself. And in when you do, how much tech forward or tech focus can it get? What is Amazon going to bring to the table that's going to differentiate them from Target or Walmart or Kroger? In my personal opinion, I don't see too much. Obviously, they have the stores where you walk in, grab all the stuff and just leave and it scans it and pays for it all. Um, but they actually have a similar thing right now at Sam's Club. And there's no really room for error because you pick up the item, you scan it in your cart and then you set it in your physical cart and when you walk out, you just hit the pay button um, and you're all set and you can show the person at the door and you leave. And that seems like a very easy system, a very minimal risk system in terms of the customer messing that up and or you scanning too many items or it missing an item like that Amazon system potentially could do. So um, there really is not a whole ton of innovation, in my personal opinion, that can be done in the grocery space. Um, at least nothing out of the ordinary. We're going to touch on that in a second. But again, I do see Target 
um, as the leader in this space. I think that Target has some of the best innovation, so to speak, or they have at least the best product to sell in terms of the grocery business. And that's why I have plowed money into Target. Obviously a dividend king, they're gonna continue to pay that dividend and focus on that dividend over the long run. So I'm not gonna be missing anything there. Um, but other competitors that I like are Kroger. I personally am a Kroger shopper for the most part. It's where my parents shop, so it's naturally kind of where I go. I prefer Target. I prefer Target um, for odds and ends. I was just there today. Um, I grabbed some water from there. This is from the tap, but I did buy some water from there, bought some deodorant and stuff. I like the experience. I like the the feeling that Target gives you, the atmosphere within the stores, the ease at which you can you know, find everything, the way all the stores are set up pretty much the same. So I have selected Target as my go-to moving forward. And to touch on that, Target has now announced they, they are going to be testing two new curbside options, making returns at the curb, and picking up Starbucks at the curb. I am extremely ecstatic for these two things to start to become tested and for the way that these two things can be introduced, innovated, and help the companies grow. Again, I touch on Amazon with their technology and Whole Foods with the potential introduction of technology. This is not that tech. This is nothing new. This isn't really a new concept. Again, they're just improving upon the staple and unfortunately boring concepts that have already been introduced um, mainstream about obviously two years ago at this point, the beginning of the pandemic. Curbside as a whole um, was never really popular and is become extremely popularized throughout this pandemic. And to introduce being able to return items through curbside and also to have Starbucks picked up curbside. Now, in terms of Starbucks, this is not going to be a massive part of people just getting their Starbucks this way. At least that's what I think. I don't think anyone's going to pull up and order their Starbucks from their phone through the Target app and pick it up in the little drive up spot. I see this more as a compliment thing. If you normally went into Starbucks, I'm sorry, if you normally went into Target and the first thing you saw was Starbucks and the first thing you grabbed every single time you went in was a drink, and now you're pulling up, you know, drive up, you're probably just going to order a drink with your order or with do it with your return or whatever it might be because you're there and that was part of your normal and usual experience. So I think this is going to be massive um, for Target more than Starbucks, but I do think that Starbucks will benefit from this in a small way, obviously picking up a little bit extra revenue. Um, maybe just gaining a little bit more awareness as this kind of is like, oh my gosh, I can just get Starbucks through the drive through That is fantastic. I'm sorry, through the, the drive up. That's fantastic. And every once in a while, someone kind of just orders a drink for fun or they try it out one time, realize they don't like it and move on. But being able to do returns through uh, this curbside option is fantastic because it just provides a better customer experience. Obviously, Target is technically the loser if someone's coming and returning a product, um, hopefully the product was not a bad product. Hopefully it just needs to be returned wrong size, whatever the case may be. But um, providing a better customer experience is really um, what it is about. You want to make sure that someone has a good experience and doesn't have to you know, go through anything they don't want to go through um, in terms of going into the store or just making it easier for customers to pull up have that item be returned and be right on their way. So I'm going to go ahead and take a drink. If you've noticed, I've been itching my eye. I don't know if I just put something in my eye with my finger. Our house just got painted. So hopefully I didn't rub paint particles in my eyeball. But yeah, that's, <laughs> that's really all I have to say about that. Um, so final wrap up on that. And really both of these two kind of grocery related stories, I have picked Target as my winner personally within this grocery space. And I think that this new addition provides a better customer experience for everybody. But again, it's not a massive innovation. Um, I don't see a ton of massive innovation happening in the in the grocery space. I'm not really sure what else you could do. I did want to touch on, I have it written here. Um, has anyone ever been into, I don't even know what store it is. I think it was like a gas station and they have those doors that show the items on the screen. So instead of opening or seeing through the glass and opening the glass door and there are all the products that you could see through the glass, they put a screen in replacement of that glass and you could see the product on the screen. I'm not a fan. 
I'm personally just not a fan of that. It doesn't make sense to put something when there's literally a clear substance that you can place on a door that we've all been using for how long. You could simply place it on the door and we can see through it and we can tell if the product is there or not. But instead we're hiding the products behind a screen. Not sure, not a fan moving forward. Sony has unveiled their new virtual reality headset for PlayStation, which will compete directly with Facebook's Quest. Um, I think that's Meta's Quest, but that is besides the point. People, everyone's still having a difficult time adjusting to the new name change. This is, um, again, something we've talked about a lot, virtual reality, the metaverse. Uh, this specific headset is a little bit more focused on gaming itself and again i've talked about how i think that gaming itself is the thing that the vr headsets and the metaverse are going to be best at gaming entertainment and then a little bit of education i don't see much use case outside of that but this one in specific is designed to be ran through a playstation and actually requires a playstation to run and then you can connect to your game and play your game you know virtual reality style i don't see this beating out Meta's product. If you have an all-in-one product where you put it on your head, you simply play the games the way that you want to play them, um, download the games directly to your new kind of console on your head, I think that's a much better use case than having to have a PlayStation, have the VR headset, and have the game. Again, it's another layer that people have to uh, pass through. And in terms of competition, I don't see this being a perfect direct competitor for that reason. Apple is expected to launch a virtual reality headset. It will probably cost $7,000 knowing Apple, um, and people will continue to just buy it out the wazoo because it's Apple, and it'll probably connect to um, your oven, your microwave, your... No, I'm just kidding. It'll probably connect to every other product in some way. You know, you'll put it on, and it'll the screen will pop up for everybody else to just watch on your Mac or your MacBook or your iPhone or whatever it is. Um, I'm not sure what Apple will do, uh, they're obviously going to make a very premium product. It's going to probably be pretty expensive. And if they're going to make these Apple arcade games kind of merged in in some way, I could see that definitely being a competitor. But I think that this is Apple getting a little bit outside of their comfort zone. If they're going to push into this new realm and become a larger player in the gaming kind of region, I think this makes sense. But as a whole, they have generally stuck to the core business of iPhone, iPad, Mac. So again, cell phone, Apple Watch, like the, the basics of technology that make your life easier. They really have never made a pure gaming play other than Apple Arcade. And they really kind of started to push the boundaries with Apple Arcade, with um, Apple Fitness, and now even with Apple TV, this is pushing outside of their, their normal wheelhouse, so to speak. So Will Apple be a better competitor if they can seamlessly integrate with Apple Arcade and make the type of games that they've been able to produce on the TV side of things, um, you know, the same quality? I think that there will definitely be an opportunity for them to compete with, with Meta. PlayStation, on the other hand, and Sony, they're going to be the odd one out um, needing a PlayStation and needing a, you know, the game as well. Um, I, I see Meta being the leader in this space, not that I think that it's the the best space to be in, um, but I see Meta continuing to be the leader. I would see Apple following right behind. Um, Apple obviously being the largest company in the world, it's going to draw eyes and attention, especially from media and tech reviewers. Um, that's really my thoughts. I, I don't like, I'm not a huge fan of the product. I'm not a huge fan of the metaverse as a whole, and so I don't have, I don't have too much positive to bring to the story. Um, two more stories, one that I did not pull up, but we're going to talk about SoFi first. Obviously, um, the stock down today. I'm not sure if the stock finished up. Oh, for all of our viewers here, let's go ahead and search it up. Oh, I have it pulled up here. SoFi did finish up at the close. Um, actually, up, wow, 5%, 51 cents on the close. It hit an intraday low of, that's what I was thinking, around that 840-ish range, it looks like, was the low. Um, got that notification on my phone. Was not pretty. I wish I had some more cash to plow into the stock, but I do not. 
Um, probably some of that driven from this, and then some of that driven, obviously, from the invasion of um, of Ukraine by Russia. But SoFi has acquired, I'm going to mess this up, Technesis. Um, Technesis is a cloud-based multi-product core banking platform. Yes, I read that right from the screen because that was an absolute mouthful. Uh, essentially, what it's going to allow SoFi to do is all-in-one all in house. So, SoFi has now purchased this company an all stock be- deal valued at 1.1 billion dollars. Um that is a lot. They did say that they were going to finance through issuing new shares, about 84 million new shares, which is clearly going to devalue um anyone who does own shares including me. Um this will devalue it, but they are expecting to be able to make this money back. They're assuming that the deal will add 500 to 800 million dollars in revenue through 2025 and also have a little bit of a cost savings around 75 to 85 million from 2023 until 2025 and then per year after 25 um, after 2025 a savings of 60 to 7 million dollars so a lot of mouthful a lot of numbers there what does this actually mean for sofi it means that they can run their banking platform and i think in specific it was you know hold deposits um, make those deposits savings checking accounts and the credit card platform this is really going to help them have their own sort of um, operating system in-house so it's not like they're saying hey technesis we want to go ahead and use your service we're going to pay you x y and z you're going to provide the service it's all going to be in-house. This this company is now owned by SoFi. They're going to run their own systems, which when you become a bank and then when you tell everybody that you have credit cards, savings accounts, investing accounts, cryptocurrencies, all, all of the sort, um, being able to control everything all in one house, I think is fantastic for the long run. In the short run, it's going to devalue the company or the stock rather. Obviously, issuing 84 million shares is not necessarily what you want to see. You want to see companies buying back shares, but SoFi is not in that phase of their of their life yet as a, as a company and as a stock. They're in the growth phase, the sort of hyper growth phase that a lot of like PayPal's and Squares were in, um, you know, probably a few years ago. So this is really going to be a long run play for me. I am invested in SoFi. I just want to obviously make that clear as I share this information. Um, But this is a very long play for me. I'm going to continue to invest in this company for the long run. They have a fantastic product, right? They have an investing platform. They have credit cards. They have actual savings and checking accounts with 1% APY at the moment. They have loans. They have a debit card that obviously can be linked to that. They have every product under the sun. And I think that for the moment, they are doing a fantastic job of providing those services to everybody. We will see how that continues to, you know, if that continues to be the truth moving forward. But SoFi, I'm bullish. I enjoy uh, this acquisition, albeit an expensive acquisition. There are some price targets um, being thrown around the average price target of $18.59, which means that at the moment, for some analysts, this stock is a buy. It did have eight buy signals and uh, three hold signals overall for a moderate buy consensus rating. So that's Wall Street's take. <laughs> that's not my personal take. I think that this company is a fantastic one for the long run. So I'm going to be more under that buy category and I am continuing to accumulate shares as well. So let's go ahead. We have one more subject to, to touch on that I forgot to actually search up. So let me go ahead and search that topic up for us all. Actually, I think I can copy the link from my iPad and just paste it in. Okay, computer. And it's going to be on the Fed. So the Fed has approved rules to ban its officials from trading stocks, bonds, and cryptocurrencies. You can see here in this video what it does prohibit individual stocks, bonds, mortgage-backed securities and derivatives, cryptocurrencies, foreign currencies, short selling, margin, commodities, and sector funds. So you might be asking right now, well, what can they trade or what can they own? They are able to own mutual funds and they must hold those mutual funds for at least a year. And after that year, if they do want to sell, they have to get permission to do so. So obviously, um, you know, they can't be on the brink of financial downturn or economic downturn and go, all right, it's time to get out of these positions because, again, that would be the form of insider trading that nobody wants to have. 
obviously this is a good thing. They do have an advantage being the people that um, operate our economy. They have an inside scoop all of the time because they are the people getting the news, getting the information. So um, this is a good move in my personal opinion towards that fairness. Now, does this stink for them? Yeah, <laughs> because my guess is they're making a ton of money from this. But um, is it fair in the broad scheme of things? No, it's not fair. And so these rules are being put into place and mutual funds look like they'll be the thing uh, building them wealth. And so they are essentially incentivized now to run the economy, the economy in a way that benefits them via mutual funds, but hopefully they continue to run the economy in a way that benefits the masses, benefits the income inequality we do have in the United States of America, um, and benefits the well-being of every American citizen. So we will see how that kind of plays out. We will see the if any news or anything does come of this. Obviously, you did have some officials uh, making their final trades and, and selling positions off. Um, as you can see, regional presidents Eric Rosengren of Boston and Robert Kaplan left their positions following the this controversy. So um, I don't know. We will see how this all plays out. This was the final story for this week in finance. I know a very heavily dominated week by this Russian announcement. However, I hope you know I could bring some interesting stories to your ears um, or to your eyeballs, however you were watching this. So if you do like this show, if you do like and enjoy This Week in Finance, go ahead, leave a like down below and subscribe. Hit that little bell next to the subscribe button. That way you can be notified every time a new episode of This Week in Finance has been released. I will see you all on Tuesday and Thursday, and then again next Sunday for uh, This Week in Finance. And I hope that you all have a great day.